Hello friends and welcome back to the Dead Game Society. Today we're looking at a game that I've never played before but have always been interested in trying out, Blade Runner. This game's one of those best games you've never played according to the internet, but has up until now been pretty much unplayable on modern hardware. That is, until now. I actually had another video in the works of a game similar to Blade Runner which I'll work on after, but on doing some topical research for that, I found out that, oh hey, this game can now run perfectly well on Windows 10 using ScumVM. That's it, everything else is being put on hold, this is the game I have to do a video on next. Now, this video is going to contain some spoilers for the movies, and honestly, I'm assuming you've already seen them, so I'm not going to give too much context on the world, but if that's fine with you, then carry on watching. Otherwise, go watch the movies. Seriously, they're fantastic. I would also recommend right off the bat that you play this game. I'm writing this last part of the intro after having played it, and man, go get it on GOG and then come back and listen to me talk about it if you want to. I would hate to rob you of anything this game has to offer moving forward. Are we good? Okay, great, let's begin. Starting the game, and we don't get much of a menu of any kind, just a cutscene of our intrepid protagonist, Ray McCoy. This game is set at the same time as the original movie, chronologically speaking, but we're on a totally different mission. The intro shows us some of the same industrial scenes we see in the opening of the movie, and fun fact for you, the director of the original movie based the imagery for the scene on the Wilton Chemical Plant in Redka, which isn't far from my hometown. In fact, Ridley Scott studied and made his first ever movie, titled Boy in a Bicycle, in my hometown of Hartlepool. You can still hear some flickers of the Hartlepoolian accent in interviews with him. I only have about four things really in process in development that are fundamentally written and are being polished. So off that, and I don't have a list of 40 or 50 subjects. Anyways, after some cinematic shots of the Los Angeles cityscape, we see a creepy old man make sexual advances to a young woman who doesn't appear to be dressed very appropriately to be hanging around tigers. After a very uncomfortable moment, the most evil looking guy possible walks through the door and breaks the old pervert's wrist, snaps a bird's neck and proceeds to murder all of the caged animals. We immediately get a call on our hover car, which wakes McCoy up from what I'm sure was a nice little nap. Unless this car is some sort of autopilot, McCoy isn't a very careful guy to say the least. McCoy monologues a little bit about despite the fact that he's been on the force for over a year, this is the first real case he's had. He goes into his lieutenant's office where he's told he's pretty much only getting this case because the other more experienced Blade Runners are busy with other cases. Well, we best not fuck it up then. On our way back to our hover car, we're met with a red-headed Blade Runner who McCoy is apparently friends with smoking a cigarette pretty ominously on the roof. We have a bit of a chit chat with her, stare at her ass, which she doesn't seem to mind too much, and then it's off to run sitters. We get there, and we already have our first clue. Piece of chrome. From a car? No, I think it's horse chrome. Bag it and tag it. We also speak to the officer on duty, but he doesn't offer much that we don't already know. And then we head on inside. After monologuing some more about the bloody footprints and picking up some cartridges, we see that the owner of the store is, strangely enough, alive, and he gives us a very vivid, detailed description of the suspects. What they look like? Big and scary and absolutely malevolent. We shake him down for some more information, including security footage and a reference he got from the young woman who we find out is named Lucy. He seems to think that she's working in concert with the replicants who killed all the animals, so we have to track her down. We also find out that she's 14. Ew. Going over to her workstation, we pick up a toy dog, a chopstick wrapper, and a candy bar. Nothing else to see here. Time to head back outside. The officer tells us that two of the onlookers have some information. Apparently, Lucy was hanging around with a big fat guy last week, and the car we're looking for is a black sedan. Useful stuff. We head back to our car and we're greeted with a map. Chinatown is the closest place and we've just picked up a wrapper for some chopsticks, so let's head there. Makes sense. We get a nice little cinematic of travelling through the city and man, for 97, this game looks incredible. We speak to some guy who tries to squeeze us for money before talking and then he just books it once we ask him how much the information is worth. The chef in the corner yells something about an order and then dips into the kitchen. After asking the owner how long he's worked here, apparently he hasn't been working here that long. We head on inside and start to question him. I'm looking for a girl, about 14 years old with pink hair. You seen her? I don't know her. Yeah, he definitely knows her. We'll come back once we have something a little bit more incriminating. For now, let's head on back to our apartment. In the original movie, Deckard uses a machine that allows him to enhance photographs far past their original detail. This sort of technology is, of course, pretty silly, but when we get back to our apartment after feeding our dog, we use the same device Deckard uses to enhance the last bit of security footage found on that disc the old pervert gave us. Here, however, this works. We're using footage from a digital camera, and interestingly enough, there's technology out there right now that can do this. If you haven't heard of it already, a Chinese company called Big Pixel have taken photographs with around, oh, I don't know, 195 billion pixels? Billions. I can't even wrap my head around that number. 
4,000 pixels is good enough for a good looking monitor. And 8K textures like the ones you see in Quixel's work look so realistic that my friends were legitimately fooled into thinking they were just seeing photographs when I showed it to them. But 195 billion? Here, look, can you make up that traffic sign? How about now? You can see things on people's shirts. Despite the fact that this technology raises a lot of privacy concerns, you can't deny just how incredible this is. You see all that over here? That's North Korea. I looked it up, it's not north of South Korea, it's North Korea. I always wondered how countries like North Korea, hell, even my own country would look in this version of the future. I could never imagine Hartlepool looking like this, that's for sure. I know I'm rambling, but I want to talk about it because sometimes I need explanations for things nobody cares about. That's just how I get. Back to the game, we use the Enhancertron 5000 or whatever it's called, and we get a nice close-up picture of one of the perpetrators, as well as a license plate. We can explore the rest of McCoy's apartment, but there really isn't that much to see here. No messages. I'm in demand. Story of my life, McCoy. We head on over to the police station since it's the last place on the map we can visit right now, and who knows, maybe we'll find something useful. There's a bunch of floors, so let's take them one by one. On the third floor, we find the forensics lab, and the guy who works there tells us that the car the replicants were driving is a 1995 Pontiac, and that half of the animals that run it was selling were artificial. No surprise there. I want to point out that I've had to click on all of the characters I've spoken to several times to get every bit of information out of them that I possibly can, and there's quite a lot of dialogue to sit through. Little did I know that there's an option in the main menu that you can click on which actually brings up the dialogue box. This is a little bit weird, don't you think? Like, surely this should be the default setting? Ah, uh, whatever, it doesn't really matter too much. On the second floor, we have the mainframe, where we can use another enhancer. Here, just to be thorough, I take another look at one of the photos from the security footage, and, uh, that guy in the back has a pretty round head. He definitely looks on the heftier side. That Lucy kid was seen to have been hanging around with a fat guy, and has only worked at Runcid as a month. That fat chef in the back of the restaurant had also been working there a month, and it was the same restaurant that Lucy had a menu for. It's too perfect, we'll go back there once we've explored here. For now, we download a bunch of files on a bombing at a replicant manufacturing facility our redhead friend is apparently investigating. We also get to use a... firing range? Considering that this is a graphic adventure game, the inclusion of a firing range or just firing mechanics in general is pretty cool in my opinion. My first run of it is pretty crap though. I prematurely fire at civilians before I see that they're unarmed, and I get hit a couple of times. But on my third attempt, I managed to get a 42. I spent a good 30 minutes going back and attempting this cost again and again trying to beat the high score. The perfectionist in me wouldn't allow a 42, but the best I could get in the end was a 58. It annoyed me so much. There's no clear scoring criteria. Should I be aiming for the head? Am I being graded on my reaction times? Other than not getting shot at and avoiding shooting the unarmed targets, I have no clue how to beat that score beyond pure blind luck. I'm a pretty decent aimer too, but sometimes these targets will just pop out of nowhere and shoot me so fast that there's no possible way I can get to them in time. Oh, what the fuck? I even tried save scumming for a perfect score, but then that would just reset the amount of targets I've hit, but not the amount of targets left. So that didn't work either. After many, many tries, I managed to get a 58, but it's not worth the effort to go any higher. On the next floor, we see the precinct, and the precinct is pretty standard looking, apart from the fact that there's absolutely no lighting in this place. We can talk to the shady guy in the corner, who I legitimately only saw because the cursor turned green when I crossed over him, and our lieutenant has nothing new to offer either. Okay, let's try the holding cells. Here, we can question the leader of a protest group named Gregorian, who believes that replicants deserve equal rights. He's here because before the bombing happened, there was a protest group outside of the manufacturing facility, and so all fingers are pointed on them at the minute. We can listen to Crystal's interview tape with Gregorian and hear out his arguments. It's typical replicant lover hippie stuff. He denies any involvement with the bombings, and questioning him ourselves yields similar results. We can, however, put him under a void camp test. For anyone who doesn't know, this is a fictional test revolving around a series of emotionally provocative questions which are designed to provoke some sort of physical response, such as changes in heart rate, eye movements, things like that. Depending on how the subject reacts to these questions, the end result will determine whether or not they're a human or a replicant. In the original movie, the first replicant we see go through this test gets so erratic that he straight up blasts the Blade Runner questioning him through a wall, and so getting to do it in the game is awesome. I'm really glad they included this. We run him through the motions, asking him some light to intense questions and gauge his response, but he texts out just fine. With nothing else to do here, let's head back to Chinatown, see if we can't put our friend in the kitchens under a Voicom test. There's a test I'd like you to take. It won't take too long. Test? What kind of test? Kind of a personality test. Totally routine. Routine? Ah. 
damn! Get after him, McCoy. We chase him down an alleyway, and I'd like to point out that I can actually shoot this guy. Thankfully, all that training in the shooting range has prepared me to check my targets, and he doesn't seem like too much of a threat, so we just run straight past him. Considering we're in a chase sequence, McCoy takes his sweet time on those stairs. Once we get to this locked door, the chef jumps out behind us and begins stalking towards us with a butcher's knife. Almost as an experiment, I try to put my gun away to see if he'll pause, and to my ultimate surprise, he does. I try to get some answers out of him, but he gets spooked and just runs off. Coming back out of this little corridor, and we see the garage doors opened. Gaff, a character from the original movie, comes out and berates us a little for letting our target slip away. Your target gave you the slip? What happened, McCoy? You feel sorry for it? My game must have been off. Go home and get some rest. I'm sure you need it. Before we do that though, purely out of curiosity, I go back out to that dumpster to chat to the homeless guy, but it looks like he took off. Looking in the dumpster, however, and we managed to find the license plate for the car. Whether or not this will actually come in handy remains to be seen, but for now, let's head back on home and get some rest. When we get there, we check our messages, and we actually get a voicemail from Lucy thanking us for what we did for Hef Friend. McCoy deletes the message, and then we head to sleep. While McCoy is sleeping, we get a nice little cutscene of a Rastafari and Uber Eats delivery guy interrogating a Tyrell employee for the whereabouts of some of his colleagues before murdering him. You one miserable package man. No! No, please, don't! <laughs> McCoy is a pretty heavy sleeper, apparently. We wake up in the middle of the night, presumably the next day, to a message from our boss who relays all of the information of what just happened. He tells us to head on over to the Tyrell building to investigate, so we head in our hover car and make our way there. We talk to the security guard at the desk who gives us all of the information he can, and then we make our way up to the crime scene. Outside the door to the anti-gravity chamber, we find some jewellery shaped like a dragonfly. Interestingly, McCoy doesn't actually know what this is, just that it's shaped like an insect. We'll get back to that a little bit later, but for now, in we go. As you saw earlier, it's a bit of a mess in here. You can tell this guy really liked his takeout food. Let's inspect the body. Obviously, he'd been killed with an explosive, and not just because he'd been plastered on the wall with a thousand strokes. The detonator wire I pulled out of his skull told the whole story. The killer was an expert. The charge had been big enough to do the job, but not big enough to shatter the soundproof walls of the float chamber. But I wondered why the killer didn't just shoot him. Damn, this guy really had a vendetta. We don't find much else in here other than a takeout card and a dog collar. These replicants really hate animals, don't they? Also, I want to point something out here. If we click on the computer outside the chamber before we enter the room, McCoy comments on how the killer had apparently tried to access the terminal many times without success, and that's about it. But, once we pick up the dog collar and leave the chamber, if we click on it again, suddenly we can use the dog's DNA to access the files, and this gives us another clue. What the fuck? Now, I've played a fair few graphic adventure games in my time, and if they taught me anything, it's that you absolutely need to be thorough and check things multiple times, just to see if the stars have aligned correctly and something's changed. Thankfully, I was diligent enough to do this accidentally, but imagine if I'd have just left without clicking on that computer because, oh, I don't know, there's nothing that suggests a dog collar would get me access to that. This game does get some forgiveness in the fact that I don't need to go into my inventory and drag the dog collar onto the terminal like more conventional graphic adventure games do, and this applies throughout the rest of the game, but come on, this is so cryptic. We get downstairs and get ready to leave when Crystal turns up and tells us that her suspect has a similar MO to our guy, and she'll let us know if she finds anything relating to our case. Once we get into our spinner, what's this? We have a new location to explore. Animoid Row. Earlier on when McCoy picked up the earring, he mentioned something about the fact that it looks like some of the junk that might be sold there. So, let's go on over. Man, I'm consistently blown away by every screen of this game. You can tell they paid real attention when recreating the technoir style of the movie setting. We immediately speak to a fishmonger, and this is where I want to get back to that whole thing about the fact that Makai has no clue what a dragonfly is. We've heard a bunch of times now that most of the animals have pretty much gone extinct, and the fact that McCoy doesn't see that this fishmonger is trying to sell him artificial pet fish as an oddity is honestly pretty immersive to the kind of world we live in. Fish just as good as dog. No, my dog is real. Real? Oh, you must make lots of money. This is a dystopia. It's not exactly authoritarian dystopia like 1984 is, for example, but all things considered, this is a pretty bleak world. Sure, we have hover cars and a lot of technology, but the fact that sushi is sold at a premium because only a small portion of the trillions of fish that live in the ocean right now are still around to be caught is a pretty harrowing prospect. We go and speak to a Spanish jewellery salesman who, in case you somehow didn't spot it, literally sells out of a store called Dragonfly. Weirdly enough, though, she doesn't sell this piece. 
She tells us that I must be part of some wider collection and offers to find out where the rest of the pieces are if we buy something from her in the near future. Sounds like a pretty good deal. We also talk to this guy with a snake around his neck. I'll let you take a guess on whether or not it's real. But he doesn't really tell us much, except that some gun store owner nearby apparently likes going around and agitating the local vendors. Let's go check this guy out, maybe he can tell us something about the bullet casings we found at the beginning of the game. Before we do that though, we can walk into a store which is pretty obviously the same takeout place Eisendullah ordered from, and we can ask the owner about him. She tells us Eisendullah hasn't paid his tab for a month so she stopped sending food over to his workplace, and when McCoy tells her she's been murdered, she doesn't say anything, and then we buy some stew. Fix your right up, only dirty chinion, it put a spring in your step man, the ladies they be loving you. Coming back out and quick, can you guess where the gun store is? We walk into the shop and, well, he certainly looks like an American gun store owner. Talking to him reveals that he's pretty familiar with the other Blade Runners and we can even buy some special ammunition for our weapon. I want to note that at no point thus far have I seen a money counter or anything like that appear anywhere. It wasn't until I left the store and went back to the police station to ask the lieutenant for a meeting with Tyrell that I realised this, because there's an option to ask him for some more money and he gives you it. Turns out there's an inconspicuous little number on the bottom right of the menu and that's your money. This really isn't a conventional adventure game, most of the time it's labelled pretty clearly where your money is. I'd just been assuming that we had a whole bunch of money to blow, but nope, whatever. Anyhow, as I just said, we leave Animoid Row and head back to the police station, but before we do that we head back to McCoy's apartment to look at the photographs. Other than a picture of the suspect, we don't honestly learn all that much that we didn't already get from the scene. We can zoom in on the dog's collar, which we already have, a takeout box, which we already have, and a picture of the bomb, which we know the guy used to kill the scientist. After that, we head back to the station, where the lieutenant says he'll have to pull some strings, but he's pretty sure he can get us in to see Tyrell, but we'd better make sure that we have something to show for ourselves. As far as I'm concerned, there wasn't really that much else to do on Animoid Row, and I analysed everything I could see of interest in the pictures, so I head on over without hesitation. As soon as we get there, we're greeted to a scene that is pretty much ripped straight out of the movie, as Rachel, the same woman Deckard falls in love with, steps out of the shadows and asks us if we like the owl. McCoy answers in pretty much the same way Deckard does in the movie, and she tells us that Tyrell has already met with one Blade Runner a day, which is probably Deckard. We don't get any dialogue options here for any topics, so we just sit and watch as McCoy asks her about Eisendler and why the replicants would want to get their hands on DNA information. That's a stupid question. Oh yeah? Why's that? Your suspect is obviously a replicant. A very dangerous one. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't really answer anything though. They banter back and forth about how dangerous replicants are before we eventually see the man himself, Eldon Tyrell, walking into the scene as Rachel quickly backs out. He confirms our suspicions that it was indeed Deckard that came by earlier and tells us the same thing he told him in the movie. That replicants are given memories so that they have an identity, which allows them to be controlled easier. McCoy rebuttals this point by stating, I do see why a replicant who has an identity would want to steal Eisendollar's files. Please, enlighten me. They want more life. They're wasting their time. They're gonna come for you, just like they came for Eisendeller. I have nothing to fear from any of my children. I tell them all exactly what I told you. Tyrell seems pretty sure of himself considering his colleagues are dropping like flies at the minute. Well, we already know how that turns out. After the conversation is over, we leave without really having learned all that much. I kind of already had the suspicion that the replicants were murdering Tyrell employees to try and find out how to extend their lifespan. It's the same thing they do in the movie after all. And McCoy already seemed to know that too, so what exactly did we come here for? Just as fan service? It doesn't matter I guess, but eh. Let's head back to Animoid Row and have another look around. First we talk to that jewellery salesman who offers us a bracelet or something for Maggie. It's kinda ugly. But you talk me into it. You hear anything yet about that dragonfly jewelry, like what I showed you before? No, senor. My friend, he's asking for me. If you come back later, maybe I know something more. Well, she can't say we haven't bought anything at least. Let's take another stab at asking the owner of Kingston's now we have a positive idea on the suspect. This guy work for you? <laughs> no, but I wish he do. He be one fine looking man. You sure? Never seen him before. I'd remembered him for sure. Well, shit. Just as I'm about to head back to the police station, I take another look inside of the indoor marketplace and... Hmm, is that a samurai sword? Turns out he's a pawn shop broker and he sells junk to people for high prices on account of how valuable the customer might find it. We ask him about the dragonfly earring but he doesn't know anything. 
We also get a dialogue option about Gregorian, that guy in the cells who's suspected to be involved with the Tyrell bombing. Earlier in the game, we downloaded Crystal's interview tape with Gregorian, and he mentioned a Rastafarian guy and an Asian guy with a ponytail who took part in the protest. He mentioned the Asian guy to be blonde, and I didn't actually clock on until McCoy begins to accuse the guy of being involved, but yeah, he certainly has some blonde on his head. Of course, you can't really see it too good on account of the graphics, but it's a game from 97, it can be forgiven. Of course, he denies the accusations before kindly getting our picture. A hundred years ago, it was a cherished item. Whole families sat for portraits. I've seen plenty of photographs in my time. Have you ever seen this? Wait, what the fuck? After a McCoy? Jesus, he sure does take his time considering he's supposed to be chasing this dude. Uh, uh, oh, ladder. Yep, high octane chase sequence right here, guys. I am not about to have all my hard work obliterated just because you stumbled into my shop, detective. Westerners need guns and hardware. All I need is will. Damn, Crystal straight up saves our ass as soon as we pull our gun out. Of course, she has nothing better to say to McCoy other than berating him for putting ourselves in the line of fire. Not like we really had a choice. I actually decided to reload my game and do this sequence again, just for curiosity's sakes. And if you don't pull your gun out like I did earlier to the chef, Crystal never fires and he gets away. Of course, I re-reload and continue with him being dead. That motherfucker was going to slice my nuts off and I don't take too kindly to that. The chef probably would have too, but as far as I'm concerned, he was just helping a kid out. Anyways, if we explore the area we ran through, it's clear that Ezo, the Asian dude who we've just chased and got killed, was a lot more than just a pawnbroker. We'll let the uniforms handle this one though. For now, let's pick up that camera he was holding and see if we can't get any information out of it back at the precinct. I was fresh out of Leeds. Poking around Hawker's circle had been a waste of time. I had nothing to connect this Ezo character to the Eisendollar murder. But if the replicants had done in one Tyrell scientist, maybe they'd go after another. And the subcontractors down on DNA Row didn't have Tyrell's security to protect them. Well, that's that sorted. No time to spare. DNA Row it is. The first place we can head into here is an odd-looking building with a big eye out front. Ah! What do you want? I'm busy. We ask the guy inside some questions about Eisendullah, but he doesn't really have much to offer. He laments that Eisendullah is dead, and his friend possibly could be, saying that he eats supper with him every night without fail, but last night he didn't show up. Luckily for us, he works just over the road, so let's go over there and see what we find. Shit! Looks like a bomb. Please, help me. It is going to blow. Now, I'm obviously recording this voiceover after having played the game, and I won't try and recreate my first reaction to this because I don't like fake laughing at anything, but man, I was in fucking tears when this happened. Why does the game let you do that? Surely McCoy would think, hmm, if I shoot the bomb, the bomb will blow up and I will die. But nope, McCoy's life truly is in our hands. So, trying it again, we shoot the cuffs off and... Oh god damn it, just go! Okay, what the fuck? We went far enough away? Good lord. Okay, so the third time I do it, I make sure I get out of there lightning fast and get as far away as possible. We make it, but our friend here wasn't so fortunate. In his dying breaths, he tells us that we have to warn the twins, and that the person responsible for this was the dreadlock dude we've been searching for. A cop runs over and offers to clean this up for us after we explain the situation to him, and from there it's... From there it's... Oh, for fuck's sake, McCoy. From there, it's up to where the twins apparently live. Well, this place is pretty creepy. If we interact with the mannequin on the left, it doesn't shut up until we turn it back off again. Pretty much the only thing we can even interact with in this room is this mannequin, where we find an envelope hidden inside. It has a couple of hundred chinions in it, and surprisingly, it has the Runsitter's logo on it. Other than that, we can hear a voicemail from a guy called Sebastian, who's apparently trying to get the twins re-employed after Tyrell fired them for reasons we don't know yet. He's kinda angry, and you know what a cool customer he is. And in case this voice sounds familiar to you, yes, this is the same Sebastian that we find in the movie. Well, we better go tell Eyeball Paul across the street that his friend has died. Ah! Jesus, does he do this every time we enter? After breaking the news, he tells us where we can find Sebastian in the old building down the alley, and I didn't actually realise until we get there, but hey, this is the same building from the movie. I mean, I guess it makes sense since it's the exact same character from the movie, but, uh, you know. 
And sure as shit, as soon as we get into his apartment, the animatronic toys are walking around as well. It takes a good few minutes to have a proper look around, but when we climb a ladder up to the second floor, hey, that's the guy! I quickly make a save state because I know what this game is like by now, and after fumbling around trying to figure out what this game wants me to do in this room since I can't spot an exit point, I eventually realise I'm supposed to climb up the armoire. Well, this isn't the most visually appealing cutscene, but it's pretty clear that McCoy is getting his ass whooped. Told you we should have blown up the old block. It would have created problems down the line. We got problem now, man. This one? He's not a problem. He's an opportunity. After McCoy gets the shit kicked out of him, the Rastafari and Sadiq pleads to his partner that he should kill us right now with a sawn off. Luckily for McCoy, his partner disagrees and says some cryptic bullshit about what lies on the other side of the horizon. McCoy has a brief but pretty cool dream of himself standing on some alien planet with a bug crawling up his arm as Lucy appears, asking him to catch her. He wakes up soon after and what do you know, there she is. I'll let this cutscene just play out for you. Did you feel bad when they killed those animals? You were so pretty and sweet. I hoped father wouldn't do it. But Mr. Rensselaer deserved retribution. That's what father said. Why? Because he treated me bad, like I belonged to him. I'm sorry. Are you really the hunter, like father says? It's my job. Why? What do you have against us? Nothing, it's just the law. Would you hurt me? I promise you I won't. <laughs> Father will be back soon. And just like that, we're free to find a way out. I'm not sure there's actually any time limit on getting out of here, but I also don't want to find out. Now, pause for a second. Take a look at the screen and try to find what McCoy might free himself with here. That pipe? Maybe smash a glass bottle and try to free himself on the shards? Go ahead, pause the video. Had a think? Well, if you guessed whatever is supposed to be shrouded in the dark at the back of the room, congratulations! Everyone else, you failed. I'm not going to dwell on just how upset it is that you wouldn't initially think that. I'm sort of used to this shit already, but if the cares I hadn't have went green, I'd have been stuck in here for a while. Our first item we can find in here is a... block of cheese? Dairy products were choice contraband, scarce and mucho expensive. Selling them was a class A felony. Hey man, I got life for killing a cop, what are you in for? Oh, I got caught with a block of mozzarella. I guess this game came up long before vegan cheese was a thing, but still, contraband cheese? The fact that McCoy has probably never tasted pizza is pretty damn sad. Other than that, we find a doll, a photograph, and a token for an arcade McCoy recognises. If we leave out of the door at the back of the room, hey, this is the same corridor we chased the chef down in. It all ties together, leaving on the other side and we come to a lobby. Despite what I initially thought, this is apparently a motel and not some seedy abandoned building. Some guy at the counter is complaining that the clerk let the cops into his apartment. He tells us that another Blade Runner had taken something from him and says we might just be able to get it back for him. Of course, he doesn't tell us who we're looking for and just tells us to stop playing dumb when we ask him. We also ask him about Sadiq, but as usual, he doesn't know anything either. Once he leaves, we can walk into his apartment and we can find something inside of the bathtub and what looks like a badge in the drawer. Nothing else to see here, let's head on out. What the fuck happened here? Once we inspect the car, McCoy makes it clear that this is probably the car that we saw in the beginning of the game. And though the license plate has been removed, we can still ID the owner based on the vehicle's identification number if we ran it through the mainframe back at the station. Couldn't we have just done that with the license plate? I tried to figure out how to do it in the first part of the game, but nothing I tried worked, so I didn't really bother. We also find a food wrapper in the car, which McCoy recognises, because of course he does. If we go back to DNA Row, our spinner is still there and we have a couple of new locations to visit. Before we go to either of them, however, we should probably take a look at these new photographs we've been carrying. The first photo we can analyse is the one Izo took of us to stun us while he ran away, and this is where I want to draw the line on this whole picture and handsome technology. We've already spoken about how Deckard analyses a picture in the movie and how that doesn't really make much sense, but come on, assuming that the camera Izo used is an early Kodak, since, I mean, look at it. I'm surprised it's even in film, let alone in high enough detail to be able to zoom in into and around things with this much fidelity. Again, I get that this is supposed to be one of those things that we're really not supposed to question or think about, but could they not have used a cannon or something? This game was made in 97, like, cannons existed by this point. Anyways, the only thing I could find in this picture is some guy buying a strange scale. 
if we check our inventory, we found that scale in the guy's bathroom earlier, but McCoy doesn't say anything about when he picks it up, so I didn't actually realise what it was until we looked later. More interestingly, however, if we take a look at the picture of the moon bus hijacking we've been hearing about from Crystal and Gaff, we see our usual suspects. Yep, yep, and... Oh no. That can't be me. Give me a hard copy of that. Oh no, oh no. That's why McCoy's being left alive. He's being framed. In the final photograph, we see a familiar face talking to a woman at the bar. McCoy doesn't say anything about her though, so it's safe to assume we don't need to keep an eye out for her. We can also inspect the security camera at the top of the frame, which obviously means we're going to have to swing by to collect that. McCoy said earlier that he could run the vehicle ID through the mainframe to get the owner's name. However, it was made clear earlier in the game when we downloaded some clues from the mainframe that you also have to upload all of the clues that you have on you. Now that we know that McCoy is in one of those photos and it looks pretty incriminating, it would probably be best if we just avoided doing that altogether for now. So we return to Animoid Row and surprisingly the bartender just gives us the security footage. That's uh, convenient. We don't need to buy it off of him or anything. We can also go back and speak to the jewellery salesman who finally tells us that she thinks that the dragonfly we found is part of a collection owned by a nightclub owner. She doesn't know the name of the nightclub or the guy who owns it, but that's all we need for now. We have a couple of new areas to go to, so first let's check out Hysteria Hall. This is the place that we found a token for under Lucy's pillow. We find an old couple bickering outside, and McCoy is apparently pretty familiar with them. We can ask them about the cheese, and the old timer tells us that the woman who owns the Kingston restaurant apparently uses cheese in her recipes. Or at least, so it's rumoured. Does she not have any shame? We'll have to go back and talk to her at some point. For now, however, let's go into the arcades. Wait, is that Command & Conquer Red Alert? Man, I love that game. Oh, there's Lucy. We pretty bluntly tell her that she's sick, but she doesn't seem to think so. Before we get any dialogue options, she tells us that before she arrived to the Earth, she expected to see trees and birds and flowers, but as we already know, the Earth is pretty fucked up by this point. The first dialogue option we get is to put her under a Void Kampf test. Even though we pretty much already know she's a replicant, just out of curiosity, I try that option, but she just starts running as soon as we ask. No chase music plays until we follow her into the Hall of Mirrors, which is actually just a bit of a maze. You can't hear it in the video, but I'm clicking like crazy to try and run to her in time. After a bit of legwork, we catch up to her, and I have to put my gun away to get her to stop and talk to us. McCoy promised he wouldn't hurt her, and I really don't want to do that either, so I just let her run away. Something really irked me though. We could have asked her some questions before she began to run. My latest save point was back when McCoy was still tied to the chair, but I still figured it would be worth running through all of it again just to hear the rest of the dialogue. So I reload, quickly run through everything I did prior to coming to the arcade, and she's not there. Huh? I run around the environment, inside and outside, leave the scene and come back, save and reload, close the game and open the game, nothing works. I'm not sure whether or not to chalk this up to an emulation glitch or the game itself, and as far as the latter is concerned, I'm not sure if it's also a glitch or if it's intentional that she's only there sometimes. Well, I'm sure we'll get the chance to talk to her again, but still, that's pretty weird. The only other place we can go to is a used car dealership, and oh my god, if this isn't the best character in the whole game. Admiring that bishy cat, ain't you? I don't blame you, it's a classic ride in a deluxe sport package. It'll push 125 without so much as a shake. Of course, you gotta find the road for it. That's always the problem. Crazy Legs, Larry Hirsch. Pleased to meet you. Ray McCoy. You can call me Crazy, you can call me Larry. You can even call me Crazy Legs Larry. But don't call me if you don't think a hot set of wheels ain't necessary. Okay. Crazy Legs Larry. After unsuccessfully trying to sell us on the car, we leave and head back to McCoy's apartment and check out the photograph we got from the bar. Hey, wait a minute. Goozer? What's a guy like him doing in a place like that? If we pan to the right, we also see Ezel stood taking the original picture we inspected earlier. And yeah, the camera is definitely not modern enough for this sort of shit. God, it's fine, it's fine. At this point, I'm pretty stumped on where to go. I debated going to the police station to confront Goozer, but I have a suspicion he's not going to be there waiting for us. I could go to the nightclub and ask the owner about the jewellery, but I kind of want to go back to see if Sebastian's home. He wasn't there when we chased Sadiq up to the roof, but maybe he's returned, who knows. There was also a screen I didn't explore when I first entered the building. So that's where we head next, and guess what? That screen leads up to the same place the elevator does, just through a different door. Sebastian is home however, and he lets us in for some questions. We can ask him about a bunch of things. He tells us that he's a pretty solitary guy. He speaks pretty highly of Tyrell and tells us some more about the twins that were fired. They were apparently Tyrell's favourite employees before he mysteriously let them go, and Sebastian doesn't really know why. He doesn't seem to think that they'd have any grudge against Tyrell. Or, he at least tells us that they're decent guys and they wouldn't try and hurt anyone. 
When we ask Sebastian if he thinks that they're the type to help renegade replicants, he cottons on to the fact that we're a Blade Runner, and he suddenly becomes very uncomfortable. You're a Blade Runner, aren't you? Bingo. But you said you were here about the burglary. The guys who broke in might be replicants. What in the world would a replicant want from me? You worked on the Nexus 6 series, didn't you? Just a little bit. Would you say that the 6s are smarter than the old 4s and 5s? They're supposed to be. Stronger and more agile, too. So, maybe they want to learn more about themselves. Maybe they want to pick your brain about their brains. I think you should leave now, Mr. McCoy. He finally asks us to leave, and I think we've gotten just about everything we can from him anyways. I check back at the arcade, there's still no sign of Lucy, and so I decide it's finally time to check out the nightclub. It looks like a pretty seedy area, but honestly, I'd probably come here for a night out if I lived in Los Angeles. The first bar we go to is a metal bar, and McCoy monologues a little bit about the owner, Ellie Q. We try talking to the bouncer to get a meeting with Ellie Q, but he's not having any of it. We can try and talk to the dancer, but she's not saying much. So, it's across the street to the other bar. Here, we see that guy from the sushi place. He tells us his name is Gordo, and we can ask him about the chef who came around the same time he mysteriously disappeared. He says it's all a pure coincidence before getting up on stage and start to do some stand-up comedy. What does a marriage and a tornado have in common? First, there's a lot of sucking and blowing, and then you lose your house. You know what my first wife's nickname was? Twister. Okay, boomer. <laughs> a doctor calls up his patient. I got bad news, and I got worse news. The bad news is... You only got 24 hours to live. The patient says, what could be worse than that? The doctor says, I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. All right, that one wasn't too bad. Guess what happens to a replicant who does his job really well? Early retirement, baby. I see we got a celebrity in the audience. Can I get a spot, please? That's right. It's one of the boys from the local Blade Runner unit. Uh... One of the LPD's finest, Ray McCoy. Let's give a big hand. You're going down the wrong path here, Gordo. He's protecting us poor slobs, ladies and gentlemen. He even thinks you're a replicant. He can waste you right where you stand. Nice job, eh, detective? It doesn't quite work that way. How about yourself? You sure about yourself? Because I got some friends. They say they know you. You're Shit. Lying. All right, this again. Wait, what? Why can't we chase him? Okay, outside then? Fuck, there he is. Ah, shit. What? Trying to pull my gun out in the club gets us instantly thrown out. I don't have a save point ready to retry that either. Ah, I hate to have a loose end like that, but honestly at this point I'm not about to redo everything again. Well, we haven't got anything from here. At this point, I got kind of stuck on what to do. I had a little bit of a break to think about it, and I came back thinking about that cheese I was still carrying around with me. I decided to go back to Kingston's to talk to the woman about her little secret ingredient. We shake her down a little bit for some information, and she tells us that last week a guy ran by and grabbed a whole bunch of empty takeout cartons off the counter. The police laughed at the prospect of getting back empty cartons, not knowing that the real cheese was hidden inside. She obviously couldn't tell them that though, so she just had to let it go, and that's why we find a block of cheese in Lucy's apartment. We don't make any arrests, but we also don't give her it back. McCoy might want to nibble on it, I guess. Speaking of Lucy, I head back to the arcade, and finally she appears once again. This time, I avoid frightening her with a VK test and I just talk to her. We warn her about Crystal, and again, I think I'll just let this scene play out. There's another hunter after your family. We know. The woman who smokes. You've got to get out of here. You're a good man. Don't jump to any conclusions. You're gentle. Father used to be like that too. He would read to me and tell me stories. Pretty stories, so I would have pretty dreams. He doesn't do that anymore? He's out with Sadiq every night, and he and Mother, they argue about what we're going to do. He's worried about her. She hasn't been well lately. That must be tough on you. I've seen death before. But the other day, I was thinking, if a person could feel love, real love, for even just one day, I think it would all be worth it. I agree. 
out in a place with trees and a lake and flowers. I've seen places like that in books. You'll see them with your own eyes one day. You're not... you're not the hunter anymore? Go, quickly. Thank you. That's a much better resolution, I think. Now, I have a bit of a confession to make. This is about where I got up to before I got totally stuck on what to do next. I went back to the station, looked around on a wide row, checked McCoy's messages, nada. I had to look at a walkthrough. I was pretty disappointed that I couldn't get through the whole game without one, but honestly, if it meant I could continue playing the game normally, I didn't really mind so much. Turns out, I was supposed to go back to early queues and talk to the dancer, which would bring the bouncer over. While he was distracted, I was supposed to slip into this rotating booth and suddenly find myself in a much more lavish part of the club. In retrospect, this isn't even that much of a puzzle. It sounds pretty simple, but the only inkling you get that the booth is part of the puzzle is seeing it rotate when McCoy's enters the screen. Which you might think is fine, but the only time you see it happen is the first time you enter the screen, and every time after that, it stays the same. Having that in mind, you can sort of forgive me for not exactly noticing this with everything else on screen. McCoy also doesn't monologue about any secret entrances or anything like that when you enter, so it's not exactly like we get any other hints either. After we distract the bouncer long enough to make an entrance, we speak to Ellie Q, who doesn't seem surprised or bothered that we're there. We talk to him a little bit about the earring, and he tells us that he bought it for a dancer of his, who will be performing shortly if we stick around. Sounds good. We have a little bit of a drink at the bar, enjoy the, uh, entertainment, and then move into the big stage to witness the act. If we click on it, because that's not exactly a stupid idea considering the kind of game we're playing, we get immediately thrown back out. Look, but don't touch. How the fuck was I supposed to know that would happen? Thankfully, we can just repeat the same steps to get back in, but jeez, I didn't think McCoy would be a creep about it. When we get back in there, the show's over, but we can sneak on backstage and see someone who clearly isn't the same woman who got up on stage. Give yourself a pat on the back if you recognise her though, because she's the woman our old pal the animal killer was speaking to at the bar. She doesn't seem too happy when we warn her about Crystal, and she actually calls the police. I get it. You're some kind of sexual deviant. I'm finished with you. Get me the police. You're doing the right thing. Yes, this is an emergency. Early cues backstage. A customer is harassing me. Thank you. Put that away. I'm a cop. Now we wait. If your hand moves, I'll shoot. Okay. Please don't talk. The sound of your voice grates on my nerves. We waited there for a few minutes. Her gun and her eyes never wavered. Any other mark, I'd have been a dead man. But if she was a replicant, she must not have known it if she was willing to call the police. Yeah, he's definitely not a cop. This a troublemaker? Put your hands on top of your head. That's right. Ray McCoy, Rep Detect, BR-61661. Never heard of you. I saw that one coming a mile off. I report to Lieutenant Guza. Call him. I work for you? Let's go. Where's your squad car? Shut your mouth. Which precinct are we going to? I'll tell you which one. Damn it, McCoy, stop getting yourself fucking kidnapped. McCoy tries to plead his innocence to these weird phony cops, but they're not having any of it. They're convinced he's a replicant, and just as they're about to fry him to a crisp, Crystal bursts through the door. Freeze! Don't even go for it! Well, she did say. Those are shotgun pellets. McCoy should straight up be dead right now. Back on the street, Crystal informs us that those guys were mercenaries who were fired from the police force a long time ago. She tells us that the dancer who called them onto us is probably still in the building, and so it's time to get to work. She tells us to cover the balcony while she checks backstage, and when we get up there, we enter a room where we... Um... Ow. I was playing in the dark, and I had my monitor turned up too bright when this happened, and I actually had to take a second to squint and look away. Not only does she one-punch KO McCoy, she really did a number on my eyesight too. I try putting my gun away here, but it doesn't make a difference. She still knocks me out. On my third attempt, I realise I have to shoot out the projector and chase her up the ladder. Once we're up here, we can either start shooting or we can plead with her that we're not there to hurt her. I choose the latter option. I've pretty much dedicated myself to a pacifist run at this point, and I don't really see much point in straying from that path. The woman comes out from hiding and tells us that she's Clovis' partner, which also makes her Lucy's mother. McCoy tells her to escape while he distracts Crystal, and she calmly walks off screen while we're left to deal with more of Crystal's berating. How the hell did it get away? We had it cornered. This one must be pretty damn clever. Duh! What the hell? Now we'll never catch it! 
better call this in. Your vehicle close by? It's around here somewhere. Where'd you park it? Huh? I'm telling you, it was right here. Damn thing must have been stolen. Maybe you're living in an alternate reality, Slim. Attention all units. All points bulletin has been issued for Ray McCoy, formerly BR61661. Confirm one civilian kill. Ezo, considered armed and dangerous. What the hell is that? Maybe they just want to bring you in for questioning. I didn't kill Ezo. Maybe they think you're not what you think you are. Are you saying I'm a rep? Come off it. The look on your face after that last one? The minute you start to feel something for skin jobs, you're in big trouble. The impact of this scene is dampened by the frequent looping moans, but Crystal basically agrees to let us go. And from here, we lose all access to fast travel, which means now we're down in the sewers. Right after this, we get another cutscene. Ooh, we're being spoiled now, aren't we? You see Chu, the eyeball guy, wasn't lying when he said that the twins are actually Siamese twins. Just like Siamese twins, they're both polar opposites and bicker over what music to listen to. Clovis knocks on the door, but he's not there to kill them. Clovis drops the bombshell that the two are actually replicants, and they agree to help Clovis with his research on extending their lifespan. This is actually a very cool idea, I think. The idea that replicants like the twins exists opens up a whole can of worms on how many other possible genetic deformations exist within replicants. We already see how Rachel eventually gets pregnant in 2049. Tyrell is a genius, but he makes mistakes, and sometimes he also makes miracles. Well, now we're on the lam and we have to prove our innocence somehow. If we explore a little bit more into the subway tunnels, we see a room full of auto parts, and a stairway which leads to... Larry's? The rest of the sewers are like this, they all lead to different parts of the game except for Nightclub Row. I got a little bit lost down here my first time exploring it, but the game gave me certain... signposts. Going into this tunnel, and I try twice, you cannot kill these cops. Okay, let's try some other places. This tunnel leads to... um... somewhere? There's nowhere to go here except back, so we're obviously not meant to be here just yet. I say just yet because I doubt they'd just put in a screen like, Ah, what the fuck is that? I'm not kidding, that scared the shit out of me. It's cool that they included some enemies down here though. Anyways, like I was saying, I doubt they'd put in a screen like that just for you to not have to explore it somewhere later down the line. If we go down to the left, we get a ladder which leads us to our apartment block. Well, 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 if it isn't every homeowner's worst nightmare in the flesh. The first thing McCoy gets angry about isn't the fact that there's a guy with a shotgun in his living room, but that Maggie's nowhere to be seen. I think I'd be the same too. So, not only have we lost our job and our car, we're now also homeless too. Let's try this other part of the crossroads. Oh, leads us back to Ezo's place. Lucy's also here, for some reason. She asks us to void camphor, and this is definitely the most interesting VK you can do in the game. She answers all of the questions with a type of sincere naivety and innocence that only a child could have. You see a documentary about 20th century tuna boats. At the end, you feel like taking up fishing. What's fishing? Catching fish to eat with a line and a hook. Oh, I could never do that. Positive result. Subject is replicant. Test terminated. Of course, we get a positive replicant result, but I looked it up and get this. I thought this was so cool. It's randomly determined whether or not Lucy is a replicant or, in fact, a human at the very beginning of every playthrough. She tells us that she wants to stay with us and McCoy vehemently tries to explain to her that now is not a very good time. Now that that's done, we go back to check if those cops have cleared off yet since we've went over two key plot points now and, lo and behold, they're gone. If we take this elevator down, we're greeted with perhaps the nicest underground hideout I've ever seen. Clean the place up a little bit, spray some air freshener and this could be a really cool lair. If we chat at the homeless guy we almost shot when chasing the chef, he tells us that he's seen a friend of ours down here a bunch of times while conducting some underground arms dealing. But he falls asleep before giving us any more of the information that we need. Just next door to the homeless guy is a bridge which, uh... Christ, that must be the toughest rat ever. Thankfully, I have a safe from not too long- What?! Okay, let's try that again. Run back, kill the rat. Bridge looks fine. Oh, come on! The third time I try it, it works. I guess the rat needs to be in the middle of the bridge for some asinine reason. On the other side, we see the twins working away in an underground lair of their own. No, no, we tried that already. Look, we know that the adenine thymine and guanine cytosine sequences can be mutated in progress. Let's move on. Cool little fact for you, they're not just talking in pseudoscience. Adenine thymine and cytosine guanine are base pairs in DNA. Of course, they're still sort of talking pseudoscience, but they're at least using relevant terminology. I like good writing like this. 
They don't seem too surprised to see us either. They explain to McCoy that they're replicants and he seems genuinely shocked about it. After all, why would Tyrell make a mistake like that and allow them to live? They tell us that Clovis has went to see Tyrell and that they're continuing their research not only to help their fellow replicants but also to spite their creator. They elaborate a little bit on how the lifespan works by explaining how dormant viruses emerge in each part of a replicant's body at the end of their lifespan. Sebastian and Chu, the guys we met on DNA Raw and subsequently the same people who Roy Batty kills in the movie, are responsible for the secrets of the nervous system and so they're up next on the chopping block. Going up the stairs and we end up back in their office on DNA Raw. Back down and out to the left we see this really grand and elaborate scene with an air duct which leads to, you guessed it, Tyrell's lobby. Must have been a short commute to work huh? We take the elevator while the security guard is diligently being paid by the hour and neither Tyrell nor Clovis are here. The fuck? I take a look around, make sure there's no other exits, but the only thing to find here is some files which turns out to be Tyrell's own DNA, which he just conveniently left out on the meeting desk for anyone to find. We take it back down to the twins, but we've apparently exhausted our dialogue options for them. I got mega stuck here. I looked all around the sewers, tried talking to the bum, went back to the apartment, nothing. I even tried going to speak to Bob. Attention all units, be on the lookout for Ray McCoy, last seen in the fourth sector. Subject is armed and extremely dangerous. Repeat, armed and extremely dangerous. Scum sucking skin jobs everywhere. <sighs> there wasn't anything for it. I had to look at the walkthrough again. Turns out we could actually squeeze some more information out of the bum if we go up to the bar and get him a drink. We even pay for a nice flask and everything. Once we wet his appetite a little, only then he gives us some more information on Guza. With this, we can ask the twins what they know about the deal with him and Clovis, and they want to trade fast. Now we can give them the DNA we snagged from Tyrells in advance, and they give us a file containing all of Guza's dirty dealings. We get some more classic monologuing about how we can use this information against Guza, and then we set up a meeting using the twin telecommunicator upstairs. Okay, okay, how do we work this out? You can't talk over the damn phone. The sewers. I know you want to be comfortable, and I figure it's kind of like your second home down there. Damn, McCoy is savage. At the bottom of the old elevator, there's a gate. Past it, there's a chamber. It's got a round platform. Yeah, I know it. Be there, alone. You better hold up your end, or Bryant gets it all. We make our way back to the bum's crib, and Goos is conveniently already there waiting for us. He confesses to his arms deals with Ezo, framing McCoy and working with Clovis, the whole works. Speaking of, after a back and forth, we hear Clovis and Sadiq make themselves known, but they don't come out. Clovis lets Goosa know that he has a pulse rifle trained right on him, and Goosa tries unsuccessfully to bargain with them. At this point, I don't really see much of a way out without siding with Clovis, but before I can even take a shot, Sadiq snipes him while Clovis reads out some obscure poetry. Whatever is born of mortal birth must be consumed with the earth to rise from generation free. Then what have I to do with thee? Kiss my ass! I actually looked it up and the poem is titled Two Tears Are by William Blake. I actually happen to know one of his poems titled A Poison Tree by heart which is all about the dangers of repressed rage. Tatiza, however, is about what happens when we die, and it can be interpreted in two ways. Either there's a life after death, which, thanks to Christ, humans can get to after they shed their mortal coil, or that there is nothing after this life, and that we're entirely bound to the earth and nothing else. After I realised that, I also realised that, hey, this makes a lot of sense. After all, one of the main themes of Blade Runner is whether or not replicants are living organisms or whether or not they're soulless machines. To Clovis, who only has a four year lifespan, the already terrifying question of what happens when you die becomes all the more potent when you don't have a soul. For Guza, who tells Clovis to kiss his ass as he descends down into the acid, that question might have an answer. Guza might experience the spiritual freedom that Clovis and the other replicants, including Lucy, won't get when their lifespan ends. Speaking of, if we wait around after Guza bites the dust, we see Sadiq briefly run through the scene before popping McCoy 1 2. Reloading the scene and the first opportunity we get, we take out Guza first as a sign of rapport with Clovis's predicament. Clovis and Sadiq take this sign well. Clovis also begins trying to convince McCoy that he's a replicant, and honestly, at this point, all the signs are pointing towards it. Whether or not McCoy is or is not a replicant, however, is totally irrelevant. He sympathised with them enough to be on their side one way or the other. Clovis invites McCoy to meet him out at the moon bus crash landing, which we saw in that photo. Before we do that, however, let's go get our dog back. We make our way through the crossroads, back up okay, the ladder, McCoy. and... Oh, hey, Gaff. You could say that. Dealer's looking for you. And Bryant. You've been keeping the whole department hopping. You and Guza. I know. You looking for me too, Gaff? 
looking, not killing. I'm in a good mood today. You know you got some interesting neighbors, McCoy. Yeah, well, I've been too busy to visit lately. You gonna turn yourself in? I'm thinking about it. Think hard. You killed anyone yet? It's like I said before. You retire a human, your career is over. Your life too, maybe. But we don't live forever, do we? Well said, Gaff. Well said. Before we can head into our apartment, we first get a cutscene. Tyrell is trying to convince the mayor of LA to allow replicants to live on Earth and have jobs as cleanup detail out in the kibble, where 5 billion tons of toxic waste surrounds the city. Damn, 5 billion? Just out of interest, I looked it up and, yeah, this number isn't even that far off what would be possible in that sort of future. Clovis interrupts their conversation before the mayor can give a yes or no and straight up shoots him dead. He demands of Tyrell the same thing Roy ends up demanding of him in the movie, but before Clovis can put one in him, Tyrell's security team show up just in the nick of time to save him from it. And when night comes, I'll go to place fit for woe, walking along the darkened valley with silent melancholy. I would prefer him alive if possible. Again, I'm not going to do it, but that made me laugh so fucking hard. Once that's all over and done with and Tyrell looks wistfully out of the window, we fade back to McCoy where... Oh no. Well, we better get that. Pick up. I... I didn't think you were going to answer. Sorry, but I... I was just... Sleeping. What's going on? Father wants to meet you. He said he's sorry about everything he did, but he was afraid you'd lead the other hunter to them. Where is he now? Out in the Kipple, by the Moonbus. Way out, where the tunnel ends. Tell him to stay where he is, until I can find a way for all of us to escape. But... I thought we were going away together. Just you and me. Maybe we'll do it after I talk to him. You promise? We could buy a car that place next to the arcade. A ground car wouldn't get us too far. One of those flying cars would, though. It could take us all the way out to that beautiful lake. You know, the one with the trees and the flowers. Lucy, there's a good chance... I'll meet you there, okay? At the place where he sells the cars. Wait, Lucy... Aw, oh, shit. Well, we're certainly neck deep in it now. To be honest, I'd much prefer taking care of Lucy at this point. Clovis might be in a tough situation, and McCoy might also be in that situation, but Clovis is still a bit of a prick. So, for one final time, let's head through the crossroads and come back out to Larry's. Sure enough, Lucy's waiting for us, and Larry is... cooperative, though reluctant. Sure, got one up on the roof. A real beaut ain't a cheap ride, though, I'll tell you right now. I gotta take it for a test drive. Ray, uh, I always liked you. True, I hardly know you. You seem like a stand-up guy. Eventually, when this fiasco is all over and done with, I... I know you'll get me on the come, right? You're a stand-up guy, crazy. We make our way up to the roof, and wow, what a ride. Before we can have our happily ever after, though, Crystal shows up out of the shadows. She has a bit of a knack for doing that, doesn't she? Turns out that she was the one who killed Maggie, and as far as she's concerned, Maggie was just a replicant dog owned by another replicant dog. She disables the car, and just before she can disable Lucy, we return the favour. Well, turns out our escape plan is twice as fuck now, too, because the cops are waiting outside. It's all over, McCoy. You got nowhere to go and no hostages. You got two minutes. Then we're gonna clear you out. I won't let them shoot us down like that. Where'd you get that bomb? What? I stole it from Sadiq. We can die together. The only thing we'll feel is the love we have for each other. I refuse to go out that way. No shit, McCoy. We have no other choice. We've got to. Wait a minute. We're right on top of the old subway system. But they'll follow us. Not if we can get a ground car down there. Hell, we can drive right through that tunnel and disappear. What if it's collapsed? It's worth a shot. So, we blow a hole in the floor, drop the car down, and then head out of the tunnel. I didn't know where we were going, and I didn't much care. Away from the city first, and then as far as this heap could take us. 
I hadn't gotten enough of the DNA information to save either of us, so we had a limited amount of time together. We couldn't go back to the city. No doubt our days there were number two. So I decided just to drive, to keep on going in a straight line until we could go no further. Wait a minute, we still have another option there. If we ignore Lucy's request and just head straight out into the kibble, remember that area we couldn't explore before? Well, crystals still intercept us on our way and we deal with her much in the same way we did just then. From there we move on and we can see the moon bus just up ahead. Sadiq's waiting for us outside, but he tells us that he wants us to prove ourselves before he can let us in to see Clovis. As if killing two cops and letting all of their friends live wasn't enough. He also tells us that a Blade Runner killed his girlfriend, and that's why he's so bent on vengeance. We need to find something for the engine, and thankfully there's an old reactor core just lying on the ground not too far away. All of the familiar faces are here, and Clovis proclaims before them all that McCoy's one of them now. He's a hunter no more. He has come home. It's time to go, my friend. Where are we going? To the heavens, brother. To fulfill our destinies off-world. And this time, the memories we create will be our own. And that, my friends, is Blade Runner. Wow, what a fucking game. I really regret not having played this sooner, but I'm still glad that I did. So, let's review what we've just been through. First, let's get the negatives out of the way. Yes, I do have some negative things to say, but I don't want to end on those, so let's just get them all over and done with. First, while there are a lot of improvements to the formula, like not having to manually use items on things, this is very much a 90s adventure game. There's a lot of times where I was running around thinking, what the hell do I do now? And I had to really think about what had recently happened before I could infer where the game wanted me to be next. The UI is clunky, there are a lot of items which we pick up and then never use again, and there's generally just a lot of asinine design choices which really irk me. Characters will randomly be in places and then disappear, there are lots of clues which don't really point us anywhere and again, never get used at any point throughout the game. And a lot of the times, it's difficult to figure out, did I do that correctly? Okay, all done. Now onto the good stuff. The dialogue is incredibly well written and fun to listen to. McCoy as a main character is very well written and reacts appropriately to every situation put in front of him. He's an easy character to get into and I never felt polarised by his choice of words. He's no Guybrush Threepwood, but he's a competent man all in all and is supported by a great cast of characters. The music was scored by Frank Lepaki, who also did the music for the Command and Conquer games, and though it's heavily derivative of Vangelis' work on the original film with lots of the same synthy jazz sounds, there's a lot of his own talent in there that shines out and lets the soundtrack stand firmly against the OST of the movie. Of course, there is also another ending where McCoy dutifully does his job and retires Clovis and his associates, but I couldn't play the game like that. Maybe one day I'll return when I've forgotten all of the puzzles and do a replay, but for now, I'm happy with the way the game ends. It's not exactly happy, but it's a lot better than it was. McCoy escapes from the drama of it all one way or another, and in the process, learns a lot more about himself and about those around him as a consequence. In the end, it's irrelevant whether or not McCoy is or is not a replicant, the same way it's irrelevant whether or not Deckard is because the story of Blade Runner was never about giving a definitive answer to that. It was always just about exploring the question, what does it take to be human? The number one thing about this game by far has to be the setting. We see quite a bit of Los Angeles in the original movie, but they really went above and beyond in fleshing out the lore and the believability of the world here. Every screen is wonderfully detailed and really makes you believe in this fictional world of the future. The Japanese aesthetic present in the movie is just as prevalent here, 
and the constant night rain really sticks to how Ridley Scott wanted to present the movie. This is a world of perpetual darkness, and it is bleak. For all of the great new technologies, the off-world colonies, the hover cars, and the Command and Conquer arcade cabinets, humanity remains its own worst enemy. We've plundered the earth of its resources, drove animals to extinction, made cheese illegal contraband, and perhaps most importantly, forgotten what it means to be alive. The humans of LA see replicants as totally different from themselves. After all, replicants aren't real people, they don't have a soul. How could they know what it means to be human? But they feel pain, they feel love, they have experiences which are built off of the memories they've been given. And with only four years to live, it's no wonder the replicants are desperately trying to prolong their lives. They don't have that much of a future to structure. Clovis is one of the best game antagonists I've ever seen, and that's thanks in part to how he's written as an intelligent and capable man who's only lashing out in desperation because of the poor hand Tyrell has dealt him, but also in part to how the rest of the world has been laid out, so that Clovis's actions have wider context than just wanting to get revenge against his creator for his short life. He's obviously heavily based on Roy Batty, but in terms of how we experience Roy and Clovis, we get to see a lot more of what Roy's philosophy is predicated on. He's not just lashing out in desperation at Tyrell because he wants his family to have a longer life, He's doing it because he truly believes that time is precious. His memories, both his implanted ones and the one he's created for himself, are just as important to him as that of a human. And if given a longer lifespan, he knows he wouldn't take those experiences for granted, like the humans have done with everything that they've been given. In the end, Clovis is, as the Tyrell motto claims, More human than human. 